Thank you for joining us. In this episode, we sit down with Molly Dingledean, who, while running a 15-year-old jewelry business, opened uh, during COVID-19 a nonprofit organization. Uh, the story about this process and her story is absolutely fantastic. We'll start with a soundbite and then give you some more. Check it out. It started um, a couple of months ago when there was all over the news, there was shortage of PPE. My husband's a paramedic. We were kind of freaking out. Um, I had all these beautiful African wax prints that I brought back from my travels to Uganda. And I have very close friends. I consider them my family in Uganda. And they were already starting to feel the effects of the coronavirus. Their government shut down public transportation. So they were having a hard time accessing food. Um, you know, the people in the village couldn't get to the city to sell their food. The people in the city couldn't get to the village to buy food. It was so even without cases of the coronavirus there or many, they were really, really struggling. And I thought, OK, well, I'm going to do something. You know, I have to do something for my family. So I had this idea. I'm going to make some masks. I'm going to sell them to friends and family, whatever. And it just sort of grew and grew and grew. Welcome to another episode of Making It in Asheville. This is a podcast where you get to hear the stories behind some of your favorite artists and businesses here in town. Each week, we interview a different local Ashevillian entrepreneur, business owner, creative here in Asheville. We work to uncover what they're making, how they're making it, and find actionable insights that you can then apply to your own work and life. And we are your hosts. That was Sarah. I am Tony. We are a husband and wife team that moved to Asheville in May of 2019. Since then, we've set out really to answer a single question. And that question is, how does one make it in Asheville? And this podcast has been the result. We want to take a quick moment to thank our sponsors, Range Urgent Care. Uh, Range Urgent Care is a local walk-in clinic founded by a husband and wife team right here in Asheville. And they're really reimagining the way urgent care uh, is typically done. They offer a completely simplified healthcare experience that, that includes things like the ability to make an appointment so you can avoid long wait times. Uh, transparent pricing so you know what you're going to pay before you go in. They also have even uh, annual subscriptions so that you can pay a monthly fee every single month, know that you get a certain number of visits, a certain number of access to healthcare experiences. And those monthly subscription plans are for single members, single users, or for families, or for businesses. And because you listen to the Making It in Asheville podcast, we have a special offer from Range to you. And so please visit makingitinashville.com forward slash range, and you'll see how you get a free month with a annual subscription plan of either, you know, individual, family, or business. Um, you can, again, visit makingitinashville.com forward slash range or use our code on range's website. So making it in Asheville uh, as a gift code, and you will also get that one month free from range. So thank you very much, Range Urgent Care, for sponsoring season four. And with that, let's talk a little bit more about Molly Dingledine. Molly Dingledean. <laughs> let's talk, and with that, let's talk a little bit more about Molly Dingledean, uh, this week's guest. Who, I mean, uh, COVID nineteen and the coronavirus pandemic has done a lot of things to businesses, to families, to communities. I think that the story we get to tell with uh, Molly through Molly is. Um, honestly, like my dream for a business owner and entrepreneur. Yeah, it was really interesting. So just a little bit of a backstory. Sisters in Circles is the nonprofit that Molly founded, and they started producing masks during COVID-19. Um, it's a circle, a community of women that are producing all of this, and it's supporting women in Africa. Um, so it really is we get to talk more with Molly about it, but the mission for this, the vision for this actually started well before everything that happened with COVID-19, but because of everything that happening, it jump-started her entire business. So we get to hear how that story happened. She got everything up and running in like 
weeks, days. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah, and what what stands out to me is that um, Molly has been an entrepreneur for uh, a long time, about 15 years. She's been running her core jewelry business. Um, we talk about that um, with some length. But uh, the difference between being a, like, sole proprietor, owner, operator of a jewelry business and then being the leader of a, uh, I want to say she said 16 person organization. Um, it's, they're so different, uh, but the lessons and the overlap between creativity and team uh, are, are so powerful that I, I feel inspired and I'm constantly now thinking about like, well, how does our team grow and like how, what lessons can we take from this conversation and use in our own world? Yeah. And another thing that really stuck out to me was the way that Molly just sort of go, I don't want to say goes with the flow. I don't know if that's the right term, but she really does trust her intuition yeah. with everything that she does. So she's very, very intentional. And, um, she, we talk a little bit about how, you know, she trusts that intuition, but of course there are difficulties. Everything isn't just easy. Um, but that that's a really important part of her driving motivation and passion for the things that she does. Yeah. Uh, the, the flow, term and flow energy showed up a lot in this conversation and uh with that i say we just maybe continue and flow right into the conversation right into the episode and so without further ado this is episode 57 Seven. with molly dingledean please enjoy Introduce yourself and let the audience know a little bit about what's going on in your world today. Okay. I'm Molly Dingledean. Uh, I live in Asheville, North Carolina. I've been here for about 15 years. And starting about two months ago, I totally shifted my work. I am by profession a jeweler. I, when I moved to Asheville in October 2005, I moved right into a jewelry studio with two other jewelers. And sort of hit the ground running and did that. And I did sold my work through galleries and I traveled all over the country selling at craft fairs. And when COVID hit, um, that was the end. Galleries closed, craft fairs were canceled. And um, over the past couple of years, three years, I have done some extensive work in Uganda, which is in East Africa. So I've traveled there four different times. I co-founded a nonprofit um, and also was a business partner in a fair trade company. And so that took a lot of my time over the past couple of years. So I've been juggling all of those different jobs. And I was starting to get back into jewelry business and COVID hit. So my husband is a paramedic. I had all these beautiful fabrics from Africa. I thought I sew. And I thought, well, I'm going to make some face masks and sell them. And I'll give the profits to our friends in Africa or local organizations. So I started with a team of about six or eight sewers. And we got rolling and had a friend who built us a website and launched the website. And we sold out about 400 masks in 24 hours. So I thought, well... I guess this is what I'm doing now. Wow. Yeah. So that was about two months ago. Wow. And we're rolling. Yeah. So many questions. So much inspiration. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, as a little teaser trailer, trailer, I'll say, of like what's to come in the conversation. Uh, we typically start there and then say like, but how did it start? Yeah, I think it's one thing to... Um, to pivot in a business, it's another thing to just start a business. And so to go back towards the start, I have some questions like, did was your move to Asheville the start of your profession as a jeweler or was that a step in your evolution as a jeweler? I got a degree from Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, at that point it was called Metals and Jewelry. And I took studio classes and it was really art based, very much design based. We had very little training in terms of small, running a small business. And I moved to Asheville because, partly because I knew it was an artist community. 
and also because I met these two other jewelers, um, Jeffrey Giles and Joanna Goldberg, and they were already established. So I moved into their studio. They had space, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got a waitressing job for about six months and started making jewelry. And, of course, that was a continuation of the, t- the style of work I made in college. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And looking at my work now and looking at my work from – college all of my projects in college they're very much related in terms of style and inspiration so um yeah I think it was the natural next step and then the opportunity came about for me to move into a studio and it was one of those things where the door was open I was standing just inside the threshold and I was like okay I guess I'm here wow yeah so and I want to I want to stop for a moment and just paint a picture of what kind of jewelry and designs um, that you create because they're very, very particular and I think it's worth noting um, your style. Okay. How do you define it? Yeah, what, what? I can see it. How, how do you, what are the right yeah. words to describe? It is um, feminine and delicate. Uh, obviously nature inspired. If you look at my work, are you familiar with my work? Um, there's a lot of movement in all of the pieces, most of the pieces. So basically how a design starts is I, I have very simple organic shapes that I use and I cut all of those from flat sheets of silver. So different, different shapes of leaves, petals and flowers. And those are all cut from textured sheets of silver And then they're formed in different ways, so they're curved. And then I will either fabricate or assemble those into a more complex structure. So, for instance, uh, one of my um, favorite styles of earrings is there are six leaves, and they're attached with jump rings, so they move around, and they're sort of clustery. And then I attach pearls kind of interspersed in there. And... um, they look really delicate. People sometimes at shows, they'll drop them on the ground and go, oh, my gosh. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I I've hammered them. Now. <laughs> no, I've hammered them. You know, you can throw them across a room and they're not, they're not going to get hurt. You throw them in the bottom of your pocketbook, they're not going to get hurt yeah. because I want people to wear them, yeah. right? That's the yeah. point of jewelry. So anyway, back to your question about the designs. Um, I mostly am working, well, in the beginning, I worked mostly in sterling silver, and I would oxidize it. So it's basically tarnished silver, and it's, so it's a dark gray silver, and the contrast of the white pearl is really striking. And, um, and then a few years later, I added in some gold vermeil. So everything starts as silver, and then the gold is electroplated over the silver, so the cost is a lot lower, but you still get the look, and it's a higher quality than a gold-plated. Um, electro-plated. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's make sure I, I have a de- working definition of electro-plated. <laughs> I want to make sure that you're using the same definition. What, what would you, how would you describe electro-plating for those who don't know necessarily what that is? Well, I hope no other jewelers are listening <laughs> to me because... <laughs> um, So how the the process takes place is there's a a bath of liquid. Uh You put your piece to be plated. It can be silver. It can be brass. It can be nickel, whatever. It can be gold. So you put that into this bath, and there's an electric current Uh that runs through the bath. There's also a piece of gold. So if I'm having my pieces electroplated in 18 karat gold, it's actually in that bath. And so the process is somehow magically, I am not, (laughs) I don't feel like I'm well equipped to explain this, but, but, um, the, um, elements move from the one to move to the other. Yes. Come on. That does sound like magic. Wingardium Leviosa, put it in the pool and then it becomes gold. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Cool. They're electroplating. Yeah. They're electroplating. (laughs) Fun. And so I too also want to know like the defining moment for you. Like we know you went to college and you studied jewelry design um, and then went on to become a jeweler. So it seems like pretty 
makes sense that trajectory but what what was the defining moment was it before that that you were like I want to make jewelry was there a particular experience that you had or no no there was no particular experience I think it was just me I when I was a kid I there's this picture of me and I remember playing with it my favorite toy was a cotton thick cotton string with colored wooden beads and it was a snake. I called it Slinky. <laughs> T- and TM. Then, yeah. <laughs> Sponsored by Slinky. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> and as far as I can remember, I, I was making all kinds of things. I would take a roll of aluminum foil and I would make little sculptures. Um, I remember being up in my playroom one time and and my mom yelled down from the kitchen. She goes, I hear a lot of scotch tape being used up there. <laughs> so I would just build things. I, I, um, I made a little shoot. I had a collection of marbles and I made a shoot on the back of my bedroom door. So it was, that was probably what I was doing is, is taping this paper all over the back of my door for a little marble shoot. And then as I got older, um, I, I beaded. Actually, there is, a, there is a defining moment. I remember I was about 12 and my aunt, she is no longer with us, but she was a deadhead. She was just kind of this out there wild. Our birthdays were three days apart. Or we're both Taurus and mm-hmm. she felt a real connection to me. And she would say, oh, we're Taurian spirit. You know, we're connected in that way. And I just loved her. I thought she was so rad. And she had a friend who um, passed away from AIDS. And when that happened, I drew a picture for my Aunt Marion. And I drew a picture for his family. So and then I became friends with his brother. And his brother, they were probably around 30, and I was 12. But this guy and I kind of created this friendship. And... Christopher McMahon was his name and he gave me Kevin's bead collection and I made a necklace out of all of those beads. I still have it It has a crystal at the bottom and that, you know what, that was a defining moment. I haven't thought about it in that way, but it was a defining moment. It's incredible. Yeah. It's just a sweet, a sweet way to connect with someone and through someone I never gave that necklace away. You know, I kept it for myself. But whenever I look at that, I remember being a young person and loving jewelry. And jewelry is really personal. You know, we wear it and it's like a piece of art that we wear on our body. It's very intimate. Mm -hmm. Um, And one thing that I really love about my business is how I get to connect with the customer sometimes directly if I'm in a craft show, other times it's sold through a gallery, but especially in person when I connect with a customer and they're either buying it for themselves or they're buying it to gift to somebody else there. And every artist knows that, you know, every artist who works with a client, whether it's a commission or if they're at a show and it's, you form a friendship with that person in a way at least that's how it is for me. Mm-hmm. I've made some really close friends through selling my work to them. Yeah. Wow. And so the the teenage or early teen version of you becomes interested and excited by it seems being very like physical and crafting and creating stuff. And so mm-hmm. you you decide to pursue that at SCAD. And you think jewelry yeah. specifically because it speaks to you. And so um, I, I guess what I'm hearing is a sense of like you were, you were being called to this craft in some way and you just listened to it. Or was this a active pursuit where you're like, this is what I'm going to do. What do I need to do now? What is the next step? Like, was it uh, effort based or like flowing downstream it just a natural course of events how would you describe it I would describe it as a natural course of events I'm the kind of person and this is not my favorite quality about myself but I'm the kind of person who likes to do things that are 
relatively easy and that come naturally to me. Um, I play the piano. I never practiced. I wish my parents had made me practice because I think I could have been okay. <laughs> uh, same with guitar, same with sports. Yeah. Those things didn't come easy to me, but making things always did. And I guess I just got into jewelry because it was tactile. I like building things. Um, as a kid, I used to draw, but I was, you know, I'm not good at it. I can see things in my mind, but I don't have the skill to put the like two dimensional things. I can see it in my mind. It's a collage or a painting or something, but I don't have the skill to actually take what's in here and put it on a canvas. Mm -hmm. But you can take I, it and make it in three dimensions. You can hammer out the yeah. silver and craft it in such mm -hmm. a way that it, it, it becomes physical and real in front of you. Yeah. Wow. And I see how I work is I, I see things in my mind and, and then I'm sort of working back to figure out what the process, what the first step of that process is to get there. Hmm. Sometimes I will play around with shapes and I, sometimes it's kind of amazing. I look at, it, at my studio, the same shapes that I've been using for several years and, and then it's like the spark goes off in my mind. I'm like, oh, I could put it together in that way and get this other shape. So oftentimes it's experimental, but then other times, and usually it's a more complex design where I see it in my mind and it's not experimental at all. So I work backwards and then figure out how to build it. Wow. There, it must be a structure yeah. that's holding those flowers in that way. So how is that going to work? Where do I have to drill the holes? Where do I have to solder those pieces together? How are they going to connect? Making it beautiful from the front and then also from the back, which is something that they encouraged us to do in art school. Um, so I always think of that when yeah. I'm designing something, you yeah. know, looking at it from all sides. And that was going to be, I guess, a question is um, there were certain certain assumptions that I have on like career paths or uh, vocation paths. And my, my assumption is like to be an artist, it's probably just, you know, make the art apprentice. If you can learn from people, I'm wondering how did choosing to go to art school, uh, how has that affected and impacted your ability to actually create art? Cause what you just discussed seems very, to me at least sophisticated and the ability to see something and know the process to me assumes more than just uh, I've played around with the materials and have a sense of how it works. It sounds like it's um, education based in some way. Is that right? Is that wrong? I, um, that's a really good question. I haven't thought of that. I was very fortunate to go to art school there are a lot of incredibly talented jewelers and artists and craftspeople in all different medias who didn't. Mm -hmm. And they, they learned in other ways and they, but I think there's things that you can learn and experience in an educational setting like art school um, that of course help determine your path and help you in your craft but it's not necessary. I really don't think that it is. Um, I think that I, for me personally, maybe got a head start mm -hmm. because I was taught certain things. And if you're taught by somebody else and they say, well, from my experience, you should do it like this because that is going to be, um, you're going to be successful in this way then you have a little bit of a head start and I'm saying this for me. Mm -hmm. Um, then if I just experimented and sort of figured things out on my own, maybe I would be 38 years old and, and not as far along as I was able to go. Yeah. Having had that background and, um, but I'm really amazed at the, the artists out there, you know, especially, craftspeople like jewelers who, 
you know, they were self-taught or they went to a tech school. And I don't think there's really, there's no difference in any of us. I was just really privileged mm -hmm. to go to art school and really grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great that's a great distinction and a great point that you make. And and we've made it a lot here on the podcast, which is you can go to school to learn something and you'll certainly learn a lot and you'll certainly have the foundation to sort of uh you know, jump start the the path that you're going on, but you don't always have to. And there's tons that you have to learn just by doing the right. thing that you love right. doing. And so today you have both your uh your jewelry business, but then Sisters in Circles. We talked about Sisters in Circle lightly at the beginning. Can you give us a little bit more context? And then we want to ask some questions about like the differences and similarities between growing a jewelry business and and having you know sewers and a team to execute a design concept. So what's going on with Sisters in Circles? Tell us a little bit more. Okay. It started um, a couple of months ago when there was all over the news, there was shortage of PPE. My husband's a paramedic. We were kind of freaking out. Um, I had all these beautiful African wax prints that I brought back from my travels to Uganda. And I have very close friends. I consider them my family in Uganda. And they were already starting to feel the effects of the coronavirus. Their government shut down public transportation. So they were having a hard time accessing food. Um, you know, the people in the village couldn't get to the city to sell their food. The people in the city couldn't get to the village to buy food. It was so even without cases of the coronavirus there or many, they were really, really struggling. Mm. And I thought, OK, well, I'm going to do something. You know, I have to do something for my family. So I had this idea. I'm going to make some masks. I'm going to sell them to friends and family, whatever. And it just sort of grew and grew and grew. Um, so what we're doing now is I actually, it's very exciting. The beginning of the week incorporated sisters and in circles as a nonprofit. Wow. And our next step is going to be to, um, apply for 501 C three status. So where we are today is we are focusing on face masks made out of this African wax print. They're really bright. They're bold. They're noticeable when you see them. Um, and we're selling them through our website and, um, they are made by mostly home sewers. There's about 14 home sewers. Some of them live here in Asheville. Some mm -hmm. live other places and several are actually art friends from, some of the shows it's mm -hmm. like a it's like a traveling family anybody who's done an art show knows that you you go and you see some of the same people there and then you make friends with your next door neighbor and then you know you have become friends with them so some some of the sewers on the team are actually artist friends who are in the same boat as me um where their galleries are closed and their shows are canceled we're not sure when they're going to start again um so they're all handmade <clears throat> and I send them out to the sewers. They come back. I put them on the website. We sell them. So I've been shipping them all over the country. I don't even know how people are finding out about us, to be honest with you. <laughs> Social media, you know, somebody says, oh, I bought this from Sisters in Circles and somebody else buys it. Anyway, um, and we are donating our net profits to other organizations who are in the fight against the coronavirus or working with populations who are somehow affected. And so far we've donated $1,300 um, and locally to a food bank here in Asheville that serves 19 counties of Western North Carolina. We've donated to an organization called Wine to Water, which is based in Boone, but they work all over the world helping people get access to safe, clean water. So now mm -hmm. the coronavirus um, pandemic, they are working on hand washing stations and education in sanitation. And that's what they're focusing on. Um, I actually uh, had the privilege of taking some water filters that they gave us to Uganda wow. um, a few years ago. And 
yeah, it's really changes people's lives to have access to clean water. So I really strongly believe in that. And then we've also given to our partners in Uganda to buy food, um, soap, and recently they had flooding, which was on top of everything else, mm. just unbelievable. And so they have what, what's essentially a couple of refugee camps. And um, <clears throat> part of the work that I did before in Uganda was working with groups of women and girls, teaching them how to sew reusable sanitary pads. Mm -hmm. And so um, they've used the money to pay a sewer to make reusable sanitary pads and give them out to women and girls in the refugee camp. So that's where we are as far as our current impact. And we, as we sell more masks, as we generate more revenue, we're able to do more. And, and I'm trying to be really intentional and work with, now we have an official team of Sisters in Circles. There's, we're a small board and we're teaming up. And also I want to get input from our team of sewers because they're, you know, they're vital to the organization as it is now making these face masks. So I see it as it's it's really a community. It is legally structured. It's a you know it's a nonprofit corporation, but what it really is is a circle of women and girls globally that come together and they support each other. We do projects together to help those in need. Mm -hmm. So currently, you know, we've just started. It was a concept yeah. that I've had since last year, but I've just sort of been sitting on it like the right thing will come, you know, the right project will come that's going to launch us. And it did. Mm -hmm. And now we're moving and it's, it's really exciting to think about what we can do in the future when this is over. I don't want to be making face masks for, <laughs> for the duration <laughs> of our project. I think that's going to, that part is going to cease and then other opportunities are going to come come in um wow yeah so that's so, where we are what are you thinking when all of this is is over i mean what kind of projects are you thinking about uh, um incorporating into sisters and circles one of our board members susan she lives in illinois it's kind of a really cool way how we met each other uh, uh an artist friend did a painting um, to fundraise for our group in Uganda. This mm -hmm. is a couple of years ago. He did this beautiful painting of a woman holding her daughter. He went to an art show in Illinois. She bought it for her birthday. He put us in touch. We became fast friends. Uh, my next craft show, I actually, we, I drove out of the way to meet her. And we thought, we're going to go to Africa one day together. And a year and a half later, we did. Mm -hmm. We went to Uganda last year together. And... Um, so now she, you know, we've kept in touch and she works with, she's a doula. She has a practice in Illinois, um, working with underprivileged communities and teen mothers. So we have talked about the next Sisters in Circles project being um, supporting her program where she works with teen moms and teens who are just struggling in some way and she, I don't really even know that much about the project, but it's empowerment through movement and um, resiliency training programs. So, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, but I, I think it's. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go. You don't know what's going to happen. But I think that the way that you communicated, you will, the opportunity will show up and you'll act on it. A la this face mask, um, I, I suspect that your positioning is smart in so much as uh, we have ideas, but we'll also, I'm sure, be informed in some way. Uh, you know, the metaphor we used earlier was uh, like a stream, you're flowing towards it and it calls you and it just happens. Right. Um, I think that that is a, um, a strategic decision. I think that makes a lot of sense. The questions that are coming up for me now is my understanding of your jewelry business is that you've been in effect a lone wolf and a lone worker for the better part of the decade or 15 years 
this seems very different. You've talked about a board. You've talked about, you know, over 10 sewers. How uh, would you describe some of the differences of being in business? I'll call it alone, but you're never alone. You have, you know, office mates or, or uh, you know, uh, studio mates. But being in business alone and then building something together with these other women. Yeah, they're really different. You know, the, the structure of a business is the same, whether you're a one woman band um, or you're a large corporation or you're a nonprofit, you know, running a business, you have to have lots of different aspects of your business for it to function well. And in my jewelry business, I primarily was, was the one to do most things. I subcontracted photography I um, hired someone to do my website, and then I managed it. At different points throughout my business, I've hired um, subcontract work, so somebody would take some pieces to their home studio and do some work for me. Um, and so that was, it is amazing in a lot of ways. I have the freedom. I don't have to run ideas by anybody. I can make a decision. And, um, you know, I just have total creative freedom, which is awesome. But what comes with that is it's never over. And, and artists and craftspeople, professional artists and craftspeople know that you're all, you can always be working. You don't clock in and do your job and clock out. I mean, you can have set hours, which I do. I don't, you know, I generally don't work on the weekends for my jewelry business. I'm for sisters and circles. I'm pretty much working nonstop, but that's a different thing. Um, um, but I love working with a team. Uh, and I had, had not done that until a couple of years ago when I started all of my work in Africa. Um, but there's the community aspect that is, so much more fulfilling than, than just doing things alone. Um, it's more rewarding. I think, you know, the idea of stronger together is that's apparent when you're working with a team, if the team functions well and with sisters and circles, we we're in the beginning stages, but things are happening because we're a team. Um, a friend came in and said, let me build a website for you. Um, she was in between jobs and she built this website. And then, you know, we've had some sewers who come on the team. They say, I believe in what you're doing. I don't want to be paid for it. And so, you know, so what's happening now is not only because of me. And I don't, I don't have the sense that I own it. It's, I mean, yeah, like it was my brainchild, but what it is now and what it will always be does not belong to me. So, um, so it's, it's different. This type of work is, is much more rewarding and being able to call on your teammates and say, Hey, what do you think about this? And, and then they, they say, Hey, what do you think about this? And we just do things together. I think my spirit is more inclined to be part of a team, but I've also had 15 years of doing things by myself and making decisions by myself. So I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, wow. do you think that you would ever just transition fully into this new project of sisters and circles? Um, or do you think that you'll always, you know, continue to have the jewelry? Like, how do you see your future in the next five years or so with both of these businesses? I see, I don't want to let go of my jewelry business. Yeah. I, there's parts of it that I love too much and that's my bread and butter, you know, right, right now my business is struggling. We're, you know, yeah. we're not going hungry. We're, we're not in a terrible position like so many other families are. My husband has a secure job and I have, you know, have his blessing to step away from my business right now and not be contributing as much, but that's going to change. I need to do that. Sure. You know, I need to do that for myself and for, for my family. 
so I will get back to it. I, um, you know, for more than a, a decade, I traveled. I would, I traveled and I did art shows. And so artists who do this, they know that it's awesome in some ways. And when it's not awesome, it totally sucks. Yeah. You can put all your stuff in the car. You can drive 12 hours or more. You set it up in the rain. Maybe it's May and it's freezing outside. People don't come or a windstorm comes through and destroy, you know, like mm. anything can happen. And it's a gamble. Artists and craftspeople who do this for a living are very courageous mm. and you have to be, and you have to be resilient. And I did that for a long time and it was great. And I wouldn't mind not doing that as much anymore. Um, so I'd like to transition to more online sales mm -hmm. and yeah. maybe do a few shows a year and get my things in more galleries. Um, but I love being in my studio. I love my studio mates. You know, we, we make something and we walk up to the other person's bench and we, you know, we show it to them and it's like, give me a little critique on this. Yeah. yeah. So that again, there's that, not that we're a team, but right. we're a community of people right. supporting each other. So I'm not going to give that up, but I also, I have lived for 38 years and I know that life changes. Yeah. Things change and you can, have an expectation and that can get completely washed away by something. One of the things that came up for me as you just talked through that kind of narrative flow is um, it seems like on a micro sense, on a micro scale, you've been dealing with COVID like experiences by being an artist who sold your wares at trade shows and events, meaning uh, you can, everything can be planned. You're going to Illinois to do some craft fair. And, uh, to your point, like a tornado comes through or, uh, it's the entire thing is canceled and you've had to figure out how to solve for that or to like recoup investment. You probably had to save because you didn't know like how cyclical the business would be. And now this is clearly orders of magnitudes worse than, any version of a weekend not going the way that you planned it. Um, but you've had some exposure to that type of a problem. Um, and I, I, I find that really interesting. I've never actually thought about it in that way. And one of the things I heard you say, which I'm very excited by and interested in, is the idea of attempting to, I, I, the language I would use is like, own more of a direct relationship with the audience and have, you know, de-risk by having people come to you for your products versus you go to the trade show and hope that people are at the trade show or you go uh, and hope that the gallery has the marketing infrastructure in place to get people in and walk in and actually be buyers versus browsers. Um, I, I am constantly saying internally and with our clients, like there is... Um, there is all, it's always a good thing to be growing a community or growing an audience or growing a fan base, uh, because it makes you more anti-fragile or at least less, it makes downturns less risky because you have a direct relationship with that community who could be customers. And mm -hmm. that's what I seem to have heard. You say I might be putting words or make, making it my own way, but, um, in wanting to travel less, but wanting the business to exist, it, I'm hearing you're going to build a relationship with customers more directly, sell online, have a relationship that doesn't require you being physically in their state at their fair to buy your stuff. Does that sound right? Um, yes. I think part of that is definitely um, an interpretation, yeah. but... But, and, an, and another really important piece is I want more time to be at home. I love working from home. I didn't really have to leave my studio because there's only four of us there, but we're, I followed the rules and moved home. Mm -hmm. And I love my home life. I love my community. I want to be more present in my community so that I can work on expanding Sisters and Circles reach 
in my community, in the national community, and in the global community. So anybody who's traveled to an art fair knows that it's like, even if it's a two day show, it's like a week out mm -hmm. of your life. Cause you're packing stuff, you're getting everything ready. You're packing stuff up, you're packing up your work, you know, uh, potters and glass blowers hate jewelers because we, <laughs> we just stroll in with like a little <laughs> mini luggage, a little, little mini bag with all of our work in it. And they have these, <laughs> I travel in a Subaru yeah. and they have these trailers with huge things on them, but still yeah. it's, you've got to pack everything. Yeah. You've got to pack your car. You've got to get there. You got to get in line. You got to unpack and set things up. And that I see as that, if I'm thinking in terms of shifting my approach to my jewelry business, I see that time as time I can be in my community working or working with the sisters and circles team and, um, and building what we're doing. Yeah. And I also want my jewelry business to directly support the organization. And so that they're really more integrated. Um, for several years when I had started doing work in Uganda, they were very much separate. And, and now I feel like they they're really intertwined and that's how I want I want to grow my jewelry business and I want my customers to know that it's it's not just a business that's mm -hmm. making a profit but it has more of a um it's more of a social enterprise so we're we're ba you know, we're a baby sisters yeah. is a baby we don't know where it's gonna go I love it if there's ever been a uh, a reason to get you know serious about online marketing and email marketing and all of the digital things is is exactly what you're communicating um, makes me go yes and here here for all things that are uh, brand building storytelling about being a social enterprise that's not entirely uh, top line or bottom line driven because your the the money that comes in is being spent in all of these meaningful ways that is um that's exciting well and there seems to be this trend at least what i'm noticing with uh the coronavirus pandemic of people not they want they're wanting to spend their money more intentionally and not wanting to spend money on just a product just because it serves a purpose because right now we don't need a lot like we're at home Right. We don't need to go anywhere. We don't need to buy clothes. We don't need to buy necessarily jewelry. But if I'm going to, I want to do something that has a story behind it um, mm -hmm. and a, a human behind it and not a machine in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, so I think that's a, yeah, that's a really interesting point. One of the things that I'm thinking about is like, how are you thinking about finances through all of this like allocating enough funds to pay you know sewers to make sure that you still also are covering your cost um and then you know having enough revenue to donate to the causes that are important to you has that been a challenge how, how have you thought about the financial aspects of all of this yeah well, for a little while when we started, I was just saying that this is a project mm -hmm. and I didn't know what the structure was going to be. And so as that became more clear, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sending everything that we had in our bank account out because I didn't know what the cost of incorporating was going to be, which is not that much. I didn't mm -hmm. know, I didn't know what some of the upcoming costs were going to be, um, but we need a bookkeeper <laughs> if anybody wants to be our bookkeeper. No. Um, so I am getting all of that in order because we have enough revenue that we can give more. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I look at the numbers of how many masks we've sold and, um, you know, I, I know how much it costs to make one and I know what our profits are going to be. And then we have all these other expenses like any other business. You know, you have to buy, you have to buy packaging supplies. You've got to buy, 
Um, and we have some not employees, but some subcontractors and that part we're still working out. And once it is worked out and we've got a much better handle on what percentage is reasonable to give, um, by that time, I think the team will have identified some other organizations that we can give to. Mm -hmm. And, um, because that's really our mission. I mean, with the face masks, the sisters and circles as a broader organization, um, we have a broader mission, but this particular project making the face masks, our mission is to stop the spread and mm -hmm. support other organizations and projects that are, um, taking care of sick people, um, you know, feeding people who don't have jobs who are really struggling. Um, I sent, I made a connection with somebody out in Cal Southern California and she, this was really early on. She said, I love your masks. I'm part of this group. They're a nonprofit that works with homeless population. And she said, because we're having to stand six feet away from somebody, there's a major disconnect. And then we have to wear these masks, which is another disconnect. And when you're trying to build trust with people, it's really difficult during this time. And so she said, I, I saw your masks and I thought they were, they were just happy. They were joyful. And, um, I love the story behind them. I love what you're doing. And so I made, I, they didn't buy them. I just, I wanted to, as part of our giving, um, to send them some, and we have done, we, um, we're not a buy one, give one organization. And there's lots of, lots of businesses and projects that are doing that. And I think that's amazing. And, uh, sometimes I look at them and I think, gosh, should we be doing that? But that's not our model. And I think that there's so many different types of models that can work in business and organizations. So, um, so I sent them 15 and I don't know what, you know, I don't know where they are. I don't know what's happening with our masks in the world, yeah. but, um, I totally got off topic. Did I answer what you were asking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I mean, it, it seems, it seems like you're figuring it out as you go. And I want, and I'm asking this question because it's something that, I've always kind of struggled with is like, you know, if you're creating a product, how much is it going to cost to ship it? And like figuring out all of those costs is, is a challenge. And I, I imagine that it's even more challenging when you are um, a nonprofit that's trying to also produce some good out of this. Uh, mm -hmm. It can be hard to figure out. Yeah. Uh, how, how are you going to make enough to. I'll, I'll to ask another finance question uh, if you'll indulge us you talked about uh starting with a studio early in the process um and I, i'm wondering i'm wondering about how you've thought historically i mean are you in the same studio as you were uh 10 15 years ago have you ever had like storefronts and retail and like how have you thought to like when did you say yes to changes or evolutions in those decisions as a business was it you, you know, we've had a guest that said that they saved up like a year's worth of a salary before ever hiring a person. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any notes like that that you've thought about in, in just maybe the jewelry business? Yeah. Well, um, the answer to your studio question is um, I'm still with my same studio mates. We are in our fourth studio together. We've moved every time together. Our first studio, well, that was in 2005. It was like I think it was like 150 bucks a month. It was awesome. And then wow. we moved next door, which was a really easy move. Um, it was a little bit um, more secure. We had a gate and we were still in a basement. So it was pretty cheap. You know, that time we were all pretty successful. And we we're like, let's get out of the basement. Let's go somewhere that has more light. So we moved down the alley to a really beautiful building. There was wood floors, there was exposed brick walls, there was high ceilings, mm. a whole separate office, moved in there. And then I went to Uganda and every month I just saw, I'm like writing this check because I do, I still write a check sometimes. <laughs> I was writing <laughs> checks for my rent and, and, you know, the more I worked in Uganda, the less I worked in my studio. And so that was, that was a really big shift in, um, 
in my world, in my business, and then also in my the work that I really wanted to be doing. It was my heart work. Mm. And I felt like I am living my purpose. And it was tough because I didn't want to haul all of my stuff to Kansas City and set up for a show. But I had to. So I had this expensive studio. <clears throat> and my studio, you know, I said to them, like, I love where we are, but if we find another place, I would be happy to move. So an opportunity did come up and we moved out of downtown. We were downtown for <clears throat> about 13 years. We moved out to, um, it's a big warehouse and we have a huge space and it's a lot cheaper. It's off the beaten path. I've never had a storefront. I, um, and none of us really want to, we kind of like to get into our, we like to put on our headphones and listen to our podcasts mm -hmm. and listen to music. Back in the very beginning, we would listen to audiobooks on CD. And uh, when we were all there together, and we listened to Outlander, that was our first one. Love yeah. it. On CD. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> That, that, I mean, you you date stamped it with that, and that's like I a know, I, I know that's a really interesting, yeah. I think, evolution in terms of yeah, we're we're you know I think we're kicking around like what pros cons of having a office versus working from home, um, ha, you know, a, then even we're thinking co working space versus our own kind of office somewhere and trying to do some of the analysis, which I think a lot largely will be uh, qualitative, like what are what are our assumptions? And then also trying to think quantitatively, like what is a good percentage of expected revenue to put into a studio space or an office space mm -hmm. um, all outside of our grasp? And so we were just, you know, picking, picking your brain yeah. for experience. Yeah, where I am now, we have the space. <clears throat> We've got a garage. My husband would probably hate it because he wants a wood shop, but here, here. I can move my studio into the garage. And, but I don't want to lose the community aspect of going to work and, and having my studio mates there because we're friends after 15 years. We're really good friends. Um, I, I want that feedback. So it's worth the studio rent mm -hmm. to be in there. But, um, yeah, so I totally understand. You're weighing all these different things. One is financial, and one is, you know, your well-being and your. Yeah. So yeah, do, I, like, I like our our, that. our kitchen table is just you know stage left, and yeah. so do we want that uh, constantly while at dinner? You can't not see our office, right? Like there seems right. to be, just the the assumption is that having our office somewhere else would create a healthier. Uh, yeah. home life for us th yeah. though you know knock on wood home life is fantastic <laughs> even through right. all this craziness um, right. and I think you right. said it really well when you said it's never over um, and I think that well that's certainly true for artists it's true for I think most business owners is that they're always yeah. thinking about the next thing and so when you're home um, that can really really run over mm -hmm. into dinner into yeah <laughs> post dinner into 10 o'clock at night when you're, oh, yeah. you know, trying to sleep, but yeah, that's true. When I leave my jewelry studio, I, you know, sometimes I used to have a home office and so I would do mm -hmm. shipping and stuff from home and computer work. Um, but now all of that is at the studio. So when I come home, it's not like I can be like, well, I'm going to go after dinner and I mean, I could, I could drive 15 minutes up the road and go to the studio, but I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. But with my home studio now, my sewing studio, the office, the shipping, you know, I've taken over the downstairs. And my husband, if he goes, he works 24-hour shifts. So if he's going to work the next day, he goes to bed. You know, he'll be in bed by like 10. And I'm like, good night. And I run downstairs and I get on the sewing machine. And before I know it, it's like 2 o'clock in the morning. So, yes, boundaries are really hard when you work at home. Um, I'm really, I feel really lucky to have a, a space that's outside of my home hmm. that I can go to. Heard. And, um, I guess 
a question for you is as we are in a time in history where like the future has never been certain, right? It just felt like it might've been at, you know, moments right now. I think it's pretty clear that there is no certainty, but when you look ahead to, to the remainder of 2020, let's say, um, what things do give you the most excitement, right? It seems my guess is growing, uh, sisters and circles, but like, what, what are you looking forward to most, uh, in 2020? Um, you know, I have not, I haven't really thought about it that much, but I'm looking forward to finding some balance in my life. And that's always, that's the dance of life, right? Yeah. We're always trying to find and maintain balance. Um, I'm excited about getting my new, new jewelry website up mm. and what potential that can have, um, for my, you know, my work future. And, um, I'm the kind of person that like, if I push something too hard and it doesn't work out, I look back and I'm like, I just pushed it too hard. And the things that come into my life where I find myself in the threshold of the door with my one foot into the door and there's really only one answer and that's to move forward. If you say no, then that means you got to put your energy into backing up. And that's happened so many times in my life where things end up being right that um, I, f- I feel like I'm just kind of like flowing right now. Wow. So I, I love that. I, I, that's the energy that I've gotten from this entire call is like, <laughs> I love that you use the word flow, but I feel flow when I like when I hear you tell your story, I am visually and emotionally like flowing with you through it. Mm-hmm. And oh, wow, that's cool. Maybe that's because I only like to do easy things. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, um, but there's I, I don't want to, like, I don't want to discredit that as a actual strategic choice for people and for businesses. It's, um, I, I there is something very smart about making easy choices and doing the thing that feels right. And I think that you're, your thought about like the harder you have to push for something is often oftentimes like the the harder it will be to get done like it there there's like r- the resistance is equal and opposite to your effort um right. and i don't i wouldn't advise most people do something that feels really really hard for them mm-hmm. uh, it just it's like setting yourself up to feel all sorts of like anxiety and pressure and um and i think that the the risk probably isn't worth it whereas even when you talk about like i have this vision of a piece of art and then i break it down into like what is the next first step like even if you do have audacious or big scary goals the action item should be so small that it feels like there's limited resistance on that part of the bigger scary thing and that's what I'm hearing from you a little. Yeah. And at the same time, it's not supposed to be easy. I mean, I've learned that mm. later in life. It's like, it's really not supposed to be. It's not easy for a lot of people. And I talk about this flow and this, but like, I suck at a lot of things. <laughs> like, it's really hard for me in my jewelry business. I hate doing taxes. I hate doing bookkeeping. I'm not yeah. good at it. Every year when it comes tax time, I pitch a fit. And my husband is like, you said you were not going to do this this year. And I fall apart. You know, <laughs> So I am not like this superstar person who can do all these things. Because mm-hmm. to be totally honest with you, I am a highly sensitive person who gets really overwhelmed by things. Um, I, I feel like at my best, I'm, I'm on, I'm like teetering on this heightened level of passion and heart and energy. But then what's very close to the other side of that is feeling overwhelmed and collapsing, you know, fight. My therapist says fight, flight, collapse, or there's another one, but I collapse. And so, um, 
anyway, so all to say that that I don't think that life should be easy. Even though you're flowing, it doesn't mean that there's like not a flood sometimes or there's not this big boulder that you, you know, you like slam up against. It doesn't mean that you're off the river. Mm. It yeah. just means that that's yeah. part of the river. That's part of the journey. Yeah. And you go from side to side. And um, I definitely don't want to come across as this person who has their stuff together all the time because because you're a human <laughs> because I'm a human yeah. and I compare myself to other people I look and I say well Molly you should be able to do that because look at that person look at that person who's got three kids who's you know put themselves through got her doctorate this is my friend mm -hmm. who was my best friend is still my best friend <clears throat> she can handle everything and she, and she works out and she's a good friend and she keeps in touch with her friends and she does all of these things. And I think, Molly, you should be able to do that. I'm constantly putting pressure on myself. You should be doing this because I think that other people can do it. But the truth is, is I don't know what their life is like. Yeah. So I, I am definitely not, you know, people say, Oh, Molly, like what you're doing is so amazing. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just a vessel. Yeah. I'm just a vessel for the work that is happening. Yeah. And I think world. there's, there's a, I think you made a really, really incredible point, which is being on the river and knowing that you're on the right river, but not loving everything that comes in that river. So, uh, you right. know, the idea of like knowing that the long-term goal, the long-term vision is in line with who you are and what you want. But of course, like doing taxes is not necessarily something you love or I'm good at doing like that comes with all businesses, but it's the bigger mm -hmm. picture. That is yeah. the, the, the flow moment that I kind of see. So, yeah, I, I, I love the river metaphor. I'm getting rapids. I'm getting white water. I'm getting the <laughs> boulders. Like these are all very good, like literal things and metaphors yeah. that, um, that show up and are true. And then I could not think of the statement of, which I've only heard recently for like the last couple of years is don't shit on yourself, I like, know. <laughs> which I just, <laughs> I is so good. It makes me so happy every time. Like we, uh, I in, internally, when we, when I say should, or when I hear should, I almost always throw out should's a hard word. Yeah. Like, should is just such a hard word. There's, there's there's always baggage attached to should. Um, and, and so like I try to even internally when I'm, when my own monologue is running is, um, convert should to like have the ability to, or, um, it's an option. It's available that we, because should just it, there, one of the things that I, I've come to believe is like in, when you are present, you are in theory as powerful and um, safe and happy and all of the good feelings. And when you're in the past living mentally or living in the future, uh, you're living in an alternate reality, which is not real. And that's where pain kind of shows up. And that's where all the bad yeah. things show up and uh, should is painting a picture of the future that isn't real or should have is painting a picture of the past that isn't real. And those only lead to uh, feelings that I don't have much t time or patience for anymore because I find that I am in control of them. If I give them uh, oxygen to, you know, and room to breathe and run around, then I'm only hurting myself. Should's a hard right. word. Dang. I know. And the reason that I said that was that was me being vulnerable. Yep. Yeah. That was me being like, this is what, my life is like, mm -hmm. this is what happens in my mind sometimes. And that is really hard work. Yes. You know, it is hard work. And so all to say that, <clears throat> that I'm not perfect, that I still have struggles. And yeah, while the story is really interesting and amazing, and I feel like, you know, I am flowing right now that, um, that sometimes I'm like a head case. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the rapids are still yeah. scary. You know, the rapids are still scary. The waterfalls, yeah. scary. Like, yeah. and when the water stops running and you're still in the river, you're like, what is happening? Am I doing something wrong? Is it the, it, like, w- what is going on? And it's just that it hasn't rained in a little while. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, oh, perfect. I, I love that. I think, um, thank you for qualifying all of our flowery talk about, uh, <laughs> about flowing because I do think I, I can imagine that there were people that n- needed to hear what came as a result of that. I love it. Um, questions. We could do a whole podcast on the river like, mo- metaphor. <laughs> well, the river metaphor and how stuff sort of falls apart and the difficulties in life, because you don't go most of the time a speaker doesn't get up and talk about how hard things are for them. They talk about all the, the great things that they've done. And actually, I was supposed to, to speak at my um, high school. It was an all, all-girls school. And I was supposed to speak back in April. And I had mm. this whole speech planned out. And then the world changed. Um, but that could be a different podcast. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and my, I mean, I am a, um, I'm a hardcore glass overflowing type Mm. that's just it's a it's a little bit of a choice and it's a little bit how i was wired i guess but Mm -hmm. um i would go so far as to say that a a a keynote that is entirely about hardship is the exact same keynote that is entirely about the great moments it's just from which direction you're telling those same stories yeah and I think that it's yep. almost always a perspective difference. Um, mm-hmm. When you talk about the worst things that ever happened in my business and the best things that ever happened in my business, it's um, it's just hi- uh, highlighting the hero and the rise in action in slightly different ways. So assumption. Yeah. Um, would love to know, Sarah, you have questions. I, I, I See where you're headed. Go, 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 go. <laughs> well, so at the end of every podcast yes. uh, episode, we have a little quick speed round. It's not really a speed round. It's just um, kind of some random questions that... <laughs> Cla- class one rapids or five. Yeah. I don't know, the small ones, <laughs> just a little. <laughs> one. One, 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 one. <laughs> so uh, questions that you're not meant to think about too hard to sort of spout out uh, an answer or two. Um, I'd love to know, because you travel to Africa a lot. Is there a tradition or even a saying um from africa or uganda that you particularly love Mm, yeah so in the bakanto um tribe which is in western uh uganda i've spent enough time there where i can greet people Mm -hmm. and say thank you and um so when you say thank you uh that word is wasinja and what the other person says is wasinja which means thank you for appreciating. Mm. And I love that. I yep. love that too. I love the way that sounds. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like that the way that end of that sounded almost Italian to me. <laughs> the isima kind of thing. Yeah. Isima. Yeah. yeah. She, yeah. Like, something <laughs> reminds you of Italy. Uh, yeah, of course. It's like but... Sarah looking at a Rorschach test. It's like, well, that's Italy. That's, uh, <laughs> that's an Italian meal. <laughs> Uh, that's, uh-huh. that's a little a, bit of time. That's, that's, that's a little time. Time. Um, Awesome. Uh, to come back to Asheville, is there, when you think, I'm going to word association, Asheville community, what hmm. things show up in, in that for you? Asheville community. Food, music, um, uh, just people walking around. I'm, I am a neighborhood sort of person. I love being neighbors with people and, um, um, I'm the kind of person that is like, you need milk, you need eggs, whatever you come to me and I'll come to you. Um, just that sharing. So yeah, community, like, like really local, local. Yeah. Community. Awesome. Uh, and we know that you in your free time like to cook, uh, at home. What's one of your Mm -hmm. favorite dishes to make? Um, let's see. It depends on my mood. I'm a very moody eater. Um, one of my favorite dishes 
would be a curry, definitely a curry. Um, we are not eating currently. We're not meat eaters, but mm -hmm. when we were, I had, and this is actually a, a recipe from, um, one of my friends in Uganda. It's a, it's like a curry kind of fried chicken, vegetables, fresh vegetables. And it's so good. You can, you can yeah. send that to us if you'd like, we will taste yeah. it for the audience. Um, <laughs> and then our <laughs> last, uh, speed round question is that if we or our audience had a magic wand and was able to grant you a single wish, what wish right now in this moment would you ask for? World peace does not need to be the answer. This is not a, uh, a quiz or a pageant. That's such a hard question. Um, I've been asked that question before, not like in this specific moment, but mm -hmm. like if you had one wish, it would be to fly. Love that as an answer. I wish I Give could fly. I dreamt uh, when I was young that I was flying off of a, I don't know, it's like flying like a bird. Yeah. And I know how that feels. It probably feels like how my husband feels when he's driving a really fast car. Um, but I just love it. It's freeing. It's you're weightless. I have a thing for birds. I know it's really kitschy and there's that, sh that episode in Portlandia where it's like put a bird on everything <laughs> yes. and I'd have so much bird stuff. Um, That's a great answer. So, yeah. I'd love to Whether fly. it's in this moment or any other moment I would fly. I would walk out my door and I'd fly across the field. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great answer. That's a great answer. I'd, I'd, wow. Cool. So Molly, uh, where can we find, or our audience, where can they find more information about you and your work? Well, um, if you're interested in jewelry, you can go to mollydingledean.com. But it's a really old website, and <laughs> it's being updated literally as we speak. So don't go for like six weeks. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. And if you want to check out the work we're doing with Sisters in Circles, it's sistersincircles.org. And it. we would love to hear from you and send you a mask. And if you know somebody who needs a mask, we'll send them one too. I love that. We will have all of the links in the show notes page. But Molly, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. This was really cool. I appreciate it. And that was episode 57 with Molly Dingledean. Uh, you got to hear about the work as a artist, a creative, a solo laborer who uh, not to say like worked you know alone in the dungeon but with a team in a small like uh, work environment space studio design collaborative um, and now all of a sudden with uh, the world crumbling down in theory around us uh, launched into this new project this new endeavor um, I that gives me so much life and so much excitement um, and so Sarah how would people connect with Molly and uh, hear more about the resources and links from this episode. Yeah, we have everything listed on our show notes page. You can find that at makingitinashville.com forward slash 057. Uh, we'll list there ways you can connect with Molly as well as links to other things that she mentioned throughout the episode. Um, secondly, if you want to uh, stay in touch with everything that we're doing here at Making It in Nashville, hear about new episodes as they come out, as well as behind the scenes information, events, and so much more, please subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that at makingitinashville.com forward slash subscribe. There are also links there for you to leave a review on the podcast, which helps other people find this podcast, um, as well as with links for you to subscribe on your favorite podcast player so that you'll get notifications when new episodes come out. So one more time, that is making it in Nashville.com forward slash subscribe. And that helps you subscribe to all of the things. Uh, 
Now, a second time, we would like to thank our sponsor, Season 4 sponsor, Range Urgent Care. Um, Range is doing things in such a cool and exciting way. We are so thankful to have them in our backyard. Thoughts about uh, ways and whys you might want to go to Range include anything that is not emergency care right so like uh (laughs) one of like the jokes is if you can see the bone you probably don't want to go to range but if you might like roll your ankle which i tend to do a lot if you are feeling unwell sniffles uh coughs colds um, those type of things urgent but not emergency sound like good reasons to go to range and what we love is that you can um even have virtual visits so you could talk to someone without going into the urgent care facility you can get assessed and if needed you can go in and that the cost of the virtual visit is kind of transferred over so there are so many things to love about range that is just one of them um and if you're interested in looking and learning more about range urgent care we have a whole page on our website making it in ashville.com forward slash range because you are a listener to this podcast they have a uh, a special offer in the annual membership for you so as a single member that is a free month um, which uh, is absolutely fantastic free month of the annual membership that's also available in business plans and family plans one more time making it in ashville.com forward slash range to get that discount or learn more about range urgent care And we also want to take a moment just to let you know that this podcast is also sponsored and powered by our very own marketing agency, which is called Making It Creative. Um, Tony and I founded Making It Creative when we first moved to Asheville. It is the the reason why this podcast can still continue. Uh, We help local businesses and really national businesses um, to... And now international businesses. (laughs) Yeah, let me start over. uh, You don't have to start over. I just, that's a... Uh, breaking news, big new contract we're really excited about. Continue, Sarah. Sorry for interrupting. <laughs> sure. So we work with clients all around the world uh, yeah. um, to understand really what is their biggest marketing lever. So what's the biggest aspect of their business that they can pull to have the greatest leverage, the greatest impact on their bottom number, their revenue at the end of the day. Um, that it looks like all sorts of things from sales strategy to social media, to email marketing, to thinking about uh, content and storytelling. It really, really is customized to each of the businesses. If you want to learn more about that, please visit makingitcreative.com. You can learn more about our services and get in touch with us. Perfect. And last thing, I guess, uh, is not the last thing. Second to last thing is that we want to let you know that we have events every month we made a goal for 2020 every month we're hosting an event uh this month's monday maker mixer is coming right up so if you are interested in getting facetime virtually with other entrepreneurs artists makers um and movers and shakers in Asheville, please visit making it in com. join our email list and you will be the first to hear when events are announced. And lastly, if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the podcast, we're always looking for new people to interview. You can nominate them at makingitinashville.com forward slash podcast. We have a nifty little form there for you to fill out. Tell us a little bit more about yourself or the person that you're nominating. We'd also love to invite you to our monthly Monday Maker Mixers so that we can talk to you uh, in person or virtually if it's uh, during this pandemic uh, to get to know your business a little bit more and see your face. Perfect. And one more time, that's making it in Nashville.com forward slash podcast to nominate a guest. Episode 57 was, um, was a lot of things. It seemed, you know, so we recorded that episode. If you're in the cheap seats here, you made it to the very end. You might be interested in knowing we recorded that episode in the middle of the day. And mm-hmm. if you watch it on YouTube, it looks like it's in the middle of the night. That is the darkest midday YouTube uh, video that we've ever had. And uh, one of the lightest conversations. I absolutely love Molly. I loved this conversation. I love you, Sarah. Thank you for making it to the very, very end of this episode. Podcast. We love Listen you, it. audience. We love you. Um, and until next week, do good, be good, Sarah. High five. High five.
based on you. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, YouTube, for, for watching to the very end.